Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky appealing to the European Parliament today as he signed paperwork for immediate membership to the European Union. Zelensky getting a standing ovation from the delegates after telling them his nation is fighting for its life. While White House officials say at this hour there are unconfirmed indications that that 40-mile-long convoy of Russian tanks advancing on Kyiv has stalled, at the same time, Russian airstrikes are intensifying. Look at this. Caught on camera, witness this stunning attack and total destruction of the main government building in the city of Kharkiv. In what is described as the Times Square of the city, just under 300 miles east of Kyiv, a Russian missile hit the local government's headquarters. The attack perhaps indicates Vladimir Putin now resorting to the more lethal airstrikes as his ground invasion suffers humiliating pushback from Ukrainian citizens who have taken up arms. Calls are growing louder for NATO to declare a no-fly zone over Ukraine a dangerous gambit. We're joined live by one of those saying it's time to do that, former NATO Supreme Allied Commander General Philip Breedlove. General, declaring a, a no-fly zone over Ukraine is, many say, tantamount to an act of war. Why do you feel it should happen? Well, first of all, I'm one of those that has explained that if we declare a no-fly zone and then enforce that no-fly zone, it is essentially an act of war because it will cause us to take action against ground sites and aircraft that wander into that zone. So this is not to be taken lightly. But what I have said is that it should not be taken off the table. This is a tool that we could use as a next step short of introducing ground forces and things if we need that next step. Ukraine borders four NATO nations, Poland, Hungary, Romania, uh, Romania Slovakia. Um, this obviously, if you declared this no-fly zone, would put everybody on unbelievably high alert. Uh, what about the whole thought of mutually uh, you know, assured destruction? We know Putin has full out said he's putting his nuclear weaponry on alert. And that shouldn't surprise us, should it, Liz? Because he writes about this all the time. If you look back at several of the speeches he did in the past two years and writings that both he and his general staff always uh, uh, talk to, they mention the concept that nuclear weapons are a logical extension of the conventional battlefield. We in the West completely divide the two, but Russia does not. And so while this is something that we need to pay attention to, it is clearly not something out of the blue. It is a part of their philosophy. Well, some people believe it's just a threat and he's just bloviating. But, uh, you know, we had two guests on yesterday who understand and know Putin. Bill Browder, who ran at one point the largest hedge fund, Hermitage Capital, in Moscow. He's Putin enemy number one. And also General uh, Peter Zwack, who at one point was the highest ranking U.S. military man in Moscow. Here's what both of them said about Putin's uh, move to possibly press the button, and then I'll have you react. He has the capacity to do almost anything, and he really is the most dangerous man in the world. And that's why we have to do everything possible to stop him. We've got to raise the price of this in every way possible, because this man truly could could lead us to the end of the world. He's lost his moorings on my mind. I think he's got a siege mentality. We've seen the tremors. We see some of the oligarchs beginning to look for ways to jump ship. They're all, you know, they're all opportunistic. They're all patriotic, but they're all survivors. So they're in trouble. But in that, it's extremely dangerous because he still uh, is the primary holder in the nuclear button. Uh, General, is Putin's rhetoric real? Well, I know both these gentlemen and I respect their opinions. I may have just a tiny difference in opinion, but the fact of the matter is Mr. Putin, again, writes all the time that this capability, this nuclear weapon, is not to be distinguished from normal day-to-day -day war that it is, again, a logical extension of the conventional battlefield. So I believe we have to take this seriously. I'm hoping and, and I expect that Mr. Putin still understands the difference in that step. But his, his policies and his, his approach to warfare seems to indicate that he believes that it is a viable 
uh, option. I know that as a former NATO Supreme Allied Commander, you still to this day never speak on behalf of the current NATO members and leadership. But I would ask, because I think it's really important, do you eventually foresee NATO giving emergency status to Ukraine? And to, and to that end, do you believe Finland is going to angle to become a member of NATO? Well, uh, who knows what NATO would do, and you have it exactly right. Sackyers learned early that they can't speak for the alliance. The NAC speaks for the alliance. But um, if we're starting to see things happening, especially in Kharkiv, where we're getting very indiscriminate bombing. If we start beginning to look like Chechnya or eastern Syria, who knows what Europe, the EU, NATO will do if it gets that bad. So we need we need to be uh, focused on that, I think. Yes, and U.S. forces have arrived in Germany, as we've already reported. A bunch are in uh, Poland at the moment, and we are watching it all. General Philip Breedlove, thank you so much. Thank you, Liz.